Hello, my name's Bea Burks and I work at Marine Scotland Science and today I'm going to talk to you about motion of the ocean and the role of the ocean and changes within it to our climate. This is my talk for British Science Week and I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any questions, please do get in touch and I'll try my best to answer them. I've also been asked as a bit of an introduction to give you a background to who I am and how I got here. So here we go. I grew up in a small town very close to Brussels in Belgium. It's called Leuven um, and I had a great childhood there but I had an interest in the ocean from a very early age and so I realized that I didn't want to study that in Belgium we have a very small coastline and where I lived was actually quite far away from the sea instead I focused at secondary school at maths and science and then I went on to do ocean sciences as soon as I could so I moved to Wales uh, to a place called Bangor which is a great city in between the mountains and the sea I started with a degree in marine biology and oceanography and I quickly realized that marine biology wasn't really for me but I really enjoyed ocean physics and so I went on to study applied physical oceanography in a master's course masters of science and then I did a PhD which is a research a, a doctoral research um, project on physical oceanography I still really quite liked some marine biology and so I studied how ocean currents drive food supply to the mussel beds in the Menai Straits. And you can see the Menai Straits here, the Menai Bridge and the Strait. And you can see me doing some field work on a mud flat in between the mussel beds. And the picture in the top left is me doing some mountaineering, which I absolutely loved. And Bangor was a great place for that. After all my studies, I decided it was time to move on. And instead, I moved to um, Scotland, to Aberdeen, which is a, another lovely city in between the mountains and the sea. And I became a physical oceanographer at Marine Scotland Science. And in the last uh, year and a bit, I've been uh, the Marine Scotland Science climate change lead as well as a temporary role. It's given me great opportunities, this job, and I absolutely love it. I get to do some research, but I also get to work with great people. My research group is pictured in the bottom left there. And I've also had an opportunity to share some of my results with the um, First Minister and also with other scientists um, presenting at conferences um, around the world. So today I would like to talk to you about why the ocean is important and why ocean circulation is important. To start off, let's see just how much the ocean is in motion. This video by NASA shows you the surface currents in the ocean. And you can really see that it's constantly moving. There's um, big currents, so the little white arrows are very close together that are faster moving. There's eddies, all these whirls that keep moving round. And then there are more quiescent places, quiet places in the ocean, but actually they're never at standstill. You may wonder, why should we care that the ocean is always moving? It doesn't matter really, does it? Well, actually, the ocean is a very important source of heat transport in the Earth's system. And so it transforms, transfers warmth from the equator up towards the poles, um, which is very important for our regional climate. It's also important because it drives rainfall patterns and the most known about example is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which um, is important in influencing the rain and drought, um, rainfall and drought in the um, tropical Pacific. The ocean also transports passive organisms, very small organisms that don't really swim by themselves, but that get carried by our ocean currents. These are small plants um, called phytoplankton and small animals called zooplankton. And they're very important in the marine food web because they transfer, uh, they're the base of the um, energy um, flow through the food web. They get eaten by everything else, basically. Um, the ocean is also important for carrying pollutants, um, things like plastics and the great garbage patches of the um, ocean gyres are probably most known about in terms of plastic um, pollution, but also other pollutants like chemicals and oils, um, oil spills 
And finally, the ocean currents also provide a way for animals to navigate, larger animals to navigate. And maybe the most obvious um, example is this um, picture from Finding Nemo, where the, tor uh, the turtles um, use the ocean currents to move around um, the ocean basin. So now that we've decided the ocean is actually quite important, what does it mean for Scotland and for our climate? So these are monthly mean air temperatures between 1990 and 1999 at three places. In the red is Lerwick in Shetland, in blue is Magadan in Siberia, and in black is Anchorage, Alaska. And what you can see is that even though these three places are at exactly the same latitude, and so they should have roughly the same climate, the climate in Lerwick is actually much milder than that of the other two locations. And that's because Lerwick is on the edge of this um, ocean circulation system in the Atlantic Ocean called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. This circulation system brings warm waters northwards and is really important in driving our regional climate. These warm currents transfer their warmth up towards the atmosphere and that, brings, um, that means we've got nice, um, a nice regional climate. This is a close-up of the currents um, around Scotland and you can see that there's the North Atlantic current um, traveling um, in the in the wider basin along the shelf edge which is called is the area we call between the shallow seas the shallow areas of our um, regional seas like the North Sea and the deep ocean um, there is a, a, a band of a current coming northwards called the continental shelf edge current and um, there are smaller coastal currents as well and that's these green arrows which um, are very important for um, transport of quantities very close to the coast as well. I want to focus a little bit on the Faroe Shetland Channel, so the, the area between the Faroe Islands and the Shetland Islands, where the Atlantic water currents actually go northwards towards the Arctic, and so they transfer their heat from the Atlantic Basin into the Arctic Ocean. And we know this from observations because if you look at a temperature cross-section at these places, so um, what you can see in these figures is that on the left is um, the Faroe Islands each time of each panel, on the right is Shetland, and as you go down, you'll go down with depth. And so the top left panel shows you the temperature and you can see this really warm water um, close to the Shetland Islands of more than 10 degrees. At the same time, if you look at the panel below it, which is the salinity, so how salty the water is, you can really see that there is this core of very salty water. It's um, a practical salinity of 35.35 or higher. And if you look at the speed that this water is going, then you can see that this core is really going quite fast. It's going more than 20 centimeters per second, which is quite fast by oceanographic standards. And that's this really um, important Atlantic current going, transferring heat from the Atlantic into the Arctic. So how much water actually flows from the Atlantic towards the Arctic in the Faroe Shetland Channel? Every second, there's 160 Olympic sized swimming pools that go um, from the Atlantic into the Arctic, carrying Atlantic water. When you look at how much energy, so how much heat recalculated as energy is in that water. It's about 100 million Mars bars every second. And it's also carrying salt. And when you cal calculate out how much salt that is, it's more approximately 9,700 of these gritters. I really enjoy the gritter names here in Scotland and Gritter Tunberg is currently definitely my favorite. So, on a more serious note, we are changing our climate. Scientists now agree that the burning of fossil fuels and the change in land use has really put, um, changed our climate significantly in the last um, years. This is the global temperature variations over the last 2000 years. And you can see that from the invention of the steam engine, which is generally thought the industrial revolution, 
we very quickly warmed our climate and temperatures now are almost one degree above the pre-industrial um, concentrate um, temperatures and that's due to the greenhouse gas effect so the burning of fossil fuels and changes in land use has increased the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and they're trapping energy inside the um, Earth system. That's causing an energy imbalance. Scientists have calculated out what this Earth energy imbalance actually is, and you don't really need to worry too much about the numbers here. But what you do need to notice, hopefully, or what you will hopefully notice, is that actually more than 90% of the excess energy has been absorbed by the ocean. And so the ocean has a really important role to play in climate change. It's really buffering the impacts of climate change. At the same time, we're really starting to see the changes of, um, due to climate change in the ocean. So I already said the ocean's energy content, the heat content is increasing. At the same time, the oceans are also absorbing a lot of the um, excess carbon dioxide which means that the pH is reducing, and this is called ocean acidification. We're also seeing decreases in the ocean's oxygen content, and that's because warm water can hold less oxygen, and there's also some changes to the structure of the ocean in terms of its um, temperature and salinity structure. That has an impact. We're seeing more marine heat waves, which are these um, kind of very strong warming events. And we're also seeing increases in sea level, and that's due to both changes in the ice mass um, on land. So we're losing a lot of ice mass from land, which is putting extra water in the sea. And also because warmer water expands. And so um, if there's more warm water, then there's also a therm what's called thermal expansion uh, component to sea level. So how do we measure ocean currents so we can know that they're changing or not? Let me take you through a little tour of the oceanographer's toolkit. So we go out quite often on research vessels and this picture on the top left shows you um, the Scotia, which is Marine Scotland's research vessel. We go to places in the sea, um, generally the same places and you can see some of these on the map below. And there we measure the temperature and the salinity by lowering instruments on a crane to the seabed and back up. And at the same time, we'll take some water samples too to measure some quantities that we can't really measure with sensors yet. We can also put out instrumentation at a fixed point and the other three pictures on this um, slide show you the um, way we measure currents. So we... <coughs> measure currents by either some single point measurement systems like the strings out on the deck on the right top right or we can put instruments out that send out an acoustic single signal so a little noise and then they listen back for its reflection and they um, measure the current speeds as well we have some more traditional methods too, like drift bottles, which were um, used very often at the early ages of um, oceanography. But nowadays we also have satellite tracked versions of drift bottles called um, drifting buoys. And we have these what are called Argo floats, which are actually also measuring the temperature and the salinity at the same time. And you can see on the map, the Argo float array. So this is how many of these little floats are drifting around at each um, month between um, whenever the simulation started and we're now in about 2014 here. And you can see that we're really trying to put instruments in all the ocean basins so we have a good understanding of what's happening. In more recent years technology is really advanced and we have what are called ocean gliders. That's the um, pink thing on the top right which change their buoyancy so how how much they float and they go all the way down to um, up to 2,000 meters now and measure temperature and salinity and they come back up and they send back their data and then they do the same again and we use high frequency radar which is the antenna on the bottom right to 
basically measure how much the ocean surface is moving from these radar arrays. So what have we found out from all these experiments and all this data collection? One of the key answers has been that we can really track changes in ocean uh, parameters, such as the salinity, which is the panels on the left here, and the temperature, which are all the panels on the right. And we can um, see that as we track through the ocean currents from the south all the way to the north, so from the Rockall Trough all the way to uh, Bear Island in the Arctic Circle, we can see that there's a changes that are common to all um, places and that they follow the speed of the ocean currents. And we can also see that the ocean currents or the properties of the ocean really change because of um, signals that are memorized within it. And so the ocean has a great memory, more so than the atmosphere, which is important for our climate as well. So is the ocean circulation changing? On the left, the um, four panels with the blue lines are measurements from the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation Array at 26 degrees north, called the Rapid Array. The Rapid Array goes from Florida to the North African coast, and they measure the strength of the Atlantic Overturning Circulation. At the top, you can see the, um, the data then you can see that it has quite a strong seasonal cycle, which is the second panel down. And then on year to year um, scales, there's an even longer um, change as well. There was a very strong decline from when the measurements started to around 2010. And since then, there's been a small recovery. And you may have seen the news a few days ago that there has been um, research published that the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation is at its weakest in a thousand years. That's really important because we don't understand enough about what this week, this recent, these recent observations of strengthening now mean. And we also know that on longer term timescales, climate models predict that the Atlantic Overturning Circulation will weaken. So we will need to really keep studying um, the circulation patterns to understand what that means for our climate. The panel in the middle are the observations in Fair Shetland Channel. And there we can see again that there's been very um, big changes, but there's no clear trend yet. And for us to um, understand how what we're doing currently with the climate and how future climate change will impact our, um, the ocean and our climate we'll really need to keep studying these systems. So that was a very quick tour of the ocean circulation around Scotland and why it's important. And just in general, how motion of the ocean really does have a role to play in understanding how climate will change and what that means for our lives. I hope you enjoyed the talk. If you have any questions, as I said, feel free to get in touch and um, all the best.